Hello, good afternoon. This is our last uh, live stream show from the Inside the Vienna International Center. And in this uh, session, uh, we will discuss uh, human rights and drug control with my guests, who are uh, Damon Barrett from the International Center of Human Rights and Drug Policy, and uh, Susie also from the International, Julie, Julie, <laughs> sorry, Julie also from the International Center on uh, Human Rights and Drug Policy. And we have uh, Ricky from uh, Indonesia, uh, representing an Indonesian uh, human rights NGO. Um, and uh, I would start with a, a quote from Paul Hunt, who was a high commissioner of, on human rights many years ago. And he said that uh, the drug control system and human rights uh, exist in parallel universes because there, there is so systematic and wide abuse of the human rights of people who use drugs. Uh, 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 in the name of drug control, uh, and actually those uh, human rights violations are not reflected at all uh, in, the, in the drug control system. And now we are uh, sitting here at this, at the, actually the largest gathering of, of, the, of, the, of the drug control uh, officials. Uh, how do you see, like, is there any effort now to, to, to close this gap between human rights and drug control? The mic just automatically came to me. Uh, uh, maybe it's because I'm sitting closest or something. Um, well, I, I should clarify first that uh, Professor Hunt was the special rapporteur on the right to health. And um, when he said that, he was actually at uh, the International Harm Reduction Conference in Barcelona. And you know that because you were there filming him say it. So, um, uh, and at the time he was, he was dead right. But since that time, things have changed a bit. Now, not so much on the ground, unfortunately, but um, Professor Hunt was talking about a, uh, a number of different levels. So he had the, the disconnect in international law and policy. And he, ha he was talking very specifically, too, about an institutional disconnect at the UN level that mirrors what goes on in countries. So he was saying, look, states will say one thing uh, in Geneva uh, at the WHO or at the World Health Assembly, and then they'll go off to Vienna and say something completely different on the same topic. Um, and he was saying that's the parallel universes where they can wear different hats or different frames of reference and come up with completely different policy conclusions for the same, for the same issue. Um, and that's, that's still somewhat the case. Um, one of the things that we, we've talked about here is that there's no representative of the, the UN human rights system based here in Vienna. Even though there is one in New York, there is one in Nairobi, and there's loads of obviously in, in Geneva. Um, but that, when, he, when that speech was made, it followed the year when the first ever human rights resolution was debated here in Vienna. Um, and that, that caused a big trouble. Some states really did not want us mentioning the words human rights here. And, and these days, the change is that that's, that's standard language. And now our dilemma is the extent to which it remains at the rhetorical level, as if we don't have to change anything on the ground, because that disconnect is definitely still there. Uh, when I, I was counting, you know, how many side events are about human rights at this uh, event, I counted eight uh, different, you know, side events and all that with uh, human rights. And there are also, of course, many other side events actually which are touching upon human rights issues. So uh, I, as I see that human rights become quite central now. Uh, in the discourse, in the drug policy discourse, and that was one of the key issues also discussed two years ago at the uh, UN uh, General, uh, General Assembly Special Session on Drugs. Uh, so uh, how, how do you see that, uh, um, uh, how, 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 can, uh, how can the UN bodies contribute to uh, improving the situation in, 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 in the country level? Like, uh, do you think that uh, is there any way how what's happening here can has a, have an effect on, uh, on, for example, in your country, Ricky, in, in Indonesia, where the uh, president uh, uh, declared the war on drugs and uh, uh, many people are suffering because of that? Uh, thank you. In Indonesia, we have UNODC office. And I think uh, UNODC in Indonesia, they work closely with the National Narcotics Board. Um, and in the past few years, uh, Indonesia has been implementing very punitive approaches uh, on drugs and UNODC supporting these um, operations as well. And I think one of the things that they can do as a UN agency is moving away uh, using punitive measures uh, when they support um, government agencies in Indonesia. Um, UNODC helped train police as well, for example, and it would be great to have 
human rights training, not just anti-drugs operations as part of the police trainings, and also help strengthening um, judiciaries, for example, because, um, of course, still um, drugs are still criminalized, drug use, uh, export, imports, and those kind of things. It's violations of the law. But as a, a country that ratifies a lot of human rights instruments, Indonesia also have to respect human rights. And part of that within the judiciary is not to sentence the drug offenders to death penalty. And let alone we have a lot of unfair trial within the uh, Indonesian legal system. It's, it's heavily corrupted. Um, and many unfair trial cases um, happening, including in drugs cases. Uh, very few lawyers willing to provide assistance. Um, for foreigners, they don't get uh, proper interpreters and um, assistance from embassies, for example, are also lacking. So these are a lot of elements of unfair trial and UN agencies should take into account and provide assistance to Indonesia to um, strengthening, improve their safeguard mechanisms. Uh, another serious uh, violation of human rights of people who use drugs is, is, is the abuse in the name of treatment. There are many uh, centers where uh, people are you know, just kidnapped and uh, kept there without any kind of uh, uh, judicial process or any kind of sentence. Uh, and uh, uh, they are oftentimes tortured and uh, uh, humiliated. Uh, do you see any progress that uh, these centers will be closed? Do you see any efforts uh, uh, that... that we can do for, for that? Any of you? Um, there are some uh, centers, drug centers in um, Indonesia that use non-medical uh, interventions. Um, there's one um, drug treatment facility in Indonesia that use boiling. So they put people into boiling water and then they pray for these people hopefully to get a treat, uh, uh, recovered from their addictions. Um, and there are many unusual uh, practices of drug treatments. And so there's a need for us to highlight into these uh, drug, so-called drug treatment centers because these are not based on human rights, these are not based on um, health approaches. And, uh, and we have actually a lot of um, harm, harm reduction services in Indonesia and these are very successful. Unfortunately, these are uh, underfunded, uh, government doesn't pay attention much to this initiative. Um, government is interested to be seen as tough on drugs, to be heroic, rather than uh, saving life through these harm reduction programs. Yeah, sure. So, um, I, I don't want to dodge the question, but I want to move on from it just a little bit in that, um, okay, so this idea of what we started to call drug detention centers was a very big topic about five years ago. Uh, lots of work had been done by Human Rights Watch, lots of work had been done by the Open Society Foundations looking at these, and every UN agency eventually signed a big joint statement saying close these things down. Um, what goes on inside them is genuinely disgraceful. Everything from arbitrary detention to torture to evidence of uh, rape and sexual abuse, it, disgraceful behavior. And of course no form of treatment itself. But um, it speaks to another issue that's a bit, a bit of a problem, which is that we can get kind of dominated by the big human rights issue of, of the moment. So then it was the drug detention centers, it's the death penalty, it's the lack of access to uh, essential medicines. When, what, when you add them all up, the problem is that drug control has for decades given a way to A, dehumanize people such that uh, massive criminal sentence, uh, prison sentences for nonviolent offenses are possible. The death penalty is possible. Putting people in these kind of centers is possible. Um, describing people as junkies and, and druggies and all of this kind of stuff is possible and, and uh, it's very easy to justify repression through a drug control lens and that's the actual human rights problem and this is why we want to we keep trying to flip it around people say we need to look at it through a health lens we need to look at it the, the language here these days is we need to move to a person-centered approach imagine having to say that right as opposed to what well, security lens, and again, you can justify a lot of repression through security too. So for us, it's about trying to change something at a, at a broader level about how the whole thing is looked at, um, because otherwise we're picking away at symptoms of it. So can you talk about your work in the International Center on Human Rights and Drug Policy, like what, what you are doing there, how, how you are training students there? Sure. Um, I think the first thing is to pick up on um, your first question around the disconnects between human rights and drug policy um, and sort of the disconnect between where we see now a much stronger 
political commitments and rhetoric to the promotion and protection of human rights in venues such as the Commission of Narcotic Drugs and the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly coming out of the Young Gas Outcome document and how that becomes uh, an implementable real uh, reality in countries like Indonesia and, and really anywhere else in the world. Uh, and one of the tools that we're developing in partnership with the United Nations Development Program um, is, is somewhat of a, not a solution, but a means by which that divide can become a little bit narrower. Uh, and that's the development of international guidelines on human rights and drug policy. Uh, Ricky has been part of the, the initiative, Damon as well. Um, and we have, uh, at this stage, uh, really great commitments from governments, including the governments of Germany, Switzerland, and Colombia, with, with funding um, that's been forthcoming. Um, and it's quite clear that uh, while the rhetoric and the existence of human rights is acknowledged, embraced, there's an understanding that these obligations exist and they can't exist in parallel to drug control obligations um, and commitments to dealing with the issues of, of drug policy at a national and local level, uh, there's a real lack of understanding of how the two come together. Uh, and like Damon said, it's time to change a broader narrative to direct governments away from looking at the drug issue and looking at it from a, as a human rights issue. Uh, and so for the past year, we've been in the process of really operationalizing this, this project on guidelines. Um, and it's been a collective, multi-stakeholder effort between governments, UN institutional actors, civil society actors, and most importantly, the people that are most directly affected by problematic drug policies. Um, we've had a consulta we've had several global consultations and meetings to sort of work through the nuts and bolts, which is quite a difficult process. Um, we've had meetings in Bogota at the University of Essex, where our center is based, uh, and where there's rich knowledge um, around sort of developing normative tools on human rights and drug or human rights broadly, where Paul Hunt is also based. Um, and we have several planned in the coming year, and well, this year in Pretoria and South Africa, Bangkok, Thailand, where Ricky will join us. Um, and uh, we'll also be meeting in a more collective dimension with the community of people who use drugs at the AIDS conference in Amsterdam um, to really understand how the guidelines are reflecting the needs and experiences um, of different communities. Uh, so. You know, that's one of the, the more research or impact-oriented research uh, projects that we're working on. Uh, but again, moving back to this sort of disconnect of knowledge, bringing knowledge around human rights to sort of nerve centers of drug policy, uh, the University of Essex has a rich uh, consortium of students from all over the world who are future human rights leaders, like one of the, the gentlemen to my left here, an alumna, alumni. <laughs> um, <coughs> that don't have a lot of knowledge on the intersections between the two. So it's a really important moment to capture the imagination of young human rights uh, students around uh, the, the, alerting them to the issue that drug policy is in fact an enduring, a consistent human rights, uh, an issue of human rights concern. Um, so we've done that in a variety of different te teaching engagements. We have courses on human rights and drug policy, Damon and some of our other colleagues join us for that, and we just had one. Um, we integrate uh, ish teaching on human rights and drug policies into our, our modules for postgraduates, um, and also provide supervision for those that want to explore the issues in more full in their, their dissertation activities. So it's, it's sort of a hodgepodge of teaching and impact and, and research, um, but hopefully something that, that it, it doesn't stay in sort of the, the bubble of academia, but it permeates uh, and it w moves with the students um, throughout their professional lives. Yeah, I think it's definitely very useful and helpful when you are training young professionals and activists who will take back the, to this knowledge to their countries and uh, advocate for the rights of people who use drugs there. What do you think about the, the international organizations, the United Nations organizations? Many people would say, you know, that yeah, you know, you see that in the Philippines, you know, there are mass extrajudicial killings. A lot of people are killed. The United Nations bodies are condemning this, what's happening, and, and then the, the government is actually uh, uh, ignores this, this condemnation. So 
do you think it has still still has a relevance of, of, of what what this uh, UN UN organization say if if they just cannot enforce the 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 the, 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 the real um, well I mean that that's a perennial challenge about the UN isn't it I mean it, it, a lot, of the, a lot of the UN agencies, they're either specialized agencies or, or they're part of the UN Secretariat, but, but they're an international civil service. So it's very difficult to, to get them to, they can't force states to do anything. The, the real place where you want a bit, of, uh, a bit of courage when it comes to something like what's going on in the Philippines is from st other states. And, uh, and some of the silence around that has been dreadful. And, 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 and from, from Trump, the, the apparent support for it has been reprehensible. Um, and in the face of that, um, UN agencies are weakened um, because the kind of the, 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 the moral and legal force of what they say is undermined by the political power of, of just simply being having the, the cover of something like the United States to do nothing. Um, Trump the other day t talked about bringing back, well not bringing back, he actually talked about implementing President Clinton's death penalty laws. But um, he, uh, he emboldened Singapore straight away to, to write an op-ed op basically defending their use of the death penalty and they've, ramped, they've just initiated executions again this week. Um, so that, that kind, it's that kind of political support or not challenging these abuses that's really damaging and it, and it undermines the ability of the UN human rights system to, to, to be as effective as possibly it could be. Uh, yeah, yeah. You want to add? Um, and, I, you know, it's, it's not just a perennial challenge uh, for the UN, it's a perennial challenge for advocacy and advocates. Uh, but it doesn't mean that um, it shouldn't continue and the pressure shouldn't continue to build. Um, it requires courage and tenacity and discipline uh, to push against these powerful forces, um, particularly ones um, coming from, from the Philippines and other, other parts of the world where particularly egregious and systematic violations of human rights are happening. Um, I think one of the, you know, I think that's one of the, one way in which human rights can be a powerful but blunt instrument to push against these punitive times. Uh, but at the same time, it's also, and has to be understood as a tool to constructively engage with governments uh, outside of the more egregious systematic contexts to begin to develop new trends and new policy directions around drugs. And again, this brings us back to how the guidelines, it, it can't be used as a tool to stop the killings, but it can be used as a tool to slowly but surely move governments ready for a change in directions and lead by examples. And going back to what Damon says is that it's important for governments to ha show real leadership, real courage uh, within their own policies as well as condemning bad policies in other, other parts of the world. Vicky, coming from the, the same region, Southeast Asia, how do you see that does international pressure makes a difference on the lives of, of people you are representing? Um, I think it's uh, hugely significant. I mean, just to reiterate what Julian Damon has said, UN has limited um, powers, but it doesn't mean that we should stop doing that. Um, with regard to Indonesia, in the past, in, within just two years, they carried three rounds of executions. But I think continued interna international pressures help um, us advocates working on the ground to convey the message to the government that as an active international player, you are being watched by international community. And I think that message is it's, it's being heard now um, that Indonesia has been um, moving slightly away from executions, but not from death penalty. The death penalty is still in the law and the draft of the criminal <clears throat> code still um, plays uh, that penalty as part of the uh, criminal sanctions, but it, it will be limited in terms of applicability. But I think um, we've seen that in the past couple of years, uh, Indonesia has uh, discouraged to talk about executions because they know when, whenever they go abroad, for example, meeting at the UN, or if they have meetings uh, in Jakarta, and then they will be meeting with European ambassadors, they will be asked by these uh, government officials, European government officials or international government officials, that they want to see Indonesia moving away from that penalty. And I think at some point they will understand that they need to move from, from executions and um, criminalizations and the killings. Um, but touching on killings, unfortunately, um, although we've kind of stopped using executions, um, 
the practice is shifted to extrajudicial killing. So it's kind of following what Duterte is doing in the Philippines. In 2016, Amnesty International recorded there were 18 people killed uh, from these operations. In 2017, um, my, we, all, we documented the, the numbers of the killings from the media sources. Um, and in 2017, there were 99 people uh, killed by police and the National Narcotics Board uh, from these killings. Um, and they argued that suspected drug dealers are trying to escape or trying to resist the arrest, and that's why it ended up in killings. Um, and of course, it's a worrying trend because uh, you can see uh, increased uh, numbers from 16 in 2000, from 18 in 2016 to 99 in 2017. And we hope that uh, international pressures continue to uh, to monitor the Indonesia and to reduce the punitive measures that we are implementing at the moment because it's proven not effective since last time we had executions in July 2016, um, drug offenses continue to increase. It uh, doesn't, doesn't go down. The numbers doesn't go down. Drug users continue to be arrested. Uh, even the amount of drugs increasing, like last month there were large drug raids uh, in Indonesia, like one ton, two tons of shabu uh, seized by the police and the BNN, National, National Narcotics Board. Um, and it, and it clearly shows that you don't uh, succeed to address drug problems and you need to focus on health and harm reduction that Indonesia actually has and, and it's very successful in addressing drug problems. One of the main mantra of drug prohibition is saving the kids, you know, that, uh, that that's actually behind of, the, that's, that's, that's the argument behind of these human ri rights violations, that we have to save the young generations, we have to save children and, and, uh, and, and, and provide a, the, 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 the possibility for the right to live a drug-free life. And Damon, you wrote a book about that, that children of the drug war, uh, you put uh, this issue in a different context. So what do you think about this argument and, uh, and what do you think, what drug policies are really serving the right of the child? Um, so yeah, I, I edited that book, I should say. It was written by lots of people, including a great chapter by Ricky and colleagues from Indonesia. Um, the book, I should say, for anyone listening as well, is, is uh, avail available for free download. It was a Creative Commons book, so children of the drug war, you can look it up. Um, well, you know, I've, I've been, I've been um, buried in the, in the drafting history of the drugs conventions for, for a while uh, as part of um, PhD research. And see, one of the th I w things I was looking for is when did, when did children become part of this international treaty debate? When did they get in there? And um, the, an the answer is, is more than they just came in with the Drug Trafficking Convention, which is true. That's the first time children are mentioned, when the drug control system was at its most punitive. The question is, why were they not included earlier on? And there's two main reasons. Um, one of them is because states didn't like that intrusion into sovereignty, that level. But the next one is they didn't know what to do. States didn't know what to do. And so when they were drafting the earlier conventions, uh, they, they, one government in particular said, well, in the, in the absence of knowing what to do, we just get more repressive. But then the recommendation is, well, we still don't know what to do, so let's just get more repressive, and you end up with the 88 Trafficking Convention. And uh, the, the, the outcome of that is really that children aren't, weren't considered in the development of this system. They're, they're, they're an after-the-fact justification for ramping up the stringency of it. Um, so you see states having increased penalties for when children are involved, but they don't def define what children's involvement means. It could be anything from uh, running a message to and from two places to, to being involved in rural farming. Right now, exploiting children in the drug trade is obviously wrong, obviously wrong. But when your legal definitions are so broad that anybody, where young people might be involved, for example, in the opium harvest as just a traditional thing that's done, but when you class that as the same level of exploitation as being forced into a gang, um, that's a very different thing. And even kids who are involved in gangs, they're living in very poor areas with no opportunities. And what you do is you, you, you describe the whole thing as a victim versus perpetrator dynamic that might not reflect, reflect reality, right? Um, and the question I would ask anyway is I've been doing uh, a lot of work looking at what states say to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child about their drug policy, uh, uh, about their implementation of an article in that treaty that talks about drugs. And states feel freed 
by children's rights to, to say any number of things. So one issue that kept coming up in, in state reports to the Committee on the Rights of the Child was the death penalty. They would say, well, to protect children from drugs, as we're required to do by the Convention on the Rights of the Child, we use the death penalty, right? So that, that, that kind of freeing uh, human rights norm needs to be very carefully dealt with because the evidence suggests that states have felt liberated by that human rights provision to do whatever they want. When our view of, of human rights law and human rights-based approaches to anything is to be more of a critical, a critical ear or a critical voice, uh, a kind of a breath on the neck of government. It's like, have you, have you asked what you're doing here? So my question to any governments is really, is really very simple. How do your uh, laws and policies in fact protect children and prove it? Stop just saying it and then just going on and on and on with the same uh, positive feedback loop. Yeah, sure. Um, this is precisely the argument used by Indonesia to justify the drug war. Um, that we need to save future generation or the life of young people. And precisely this law that is intended to protect young children, young people, this is the law that put young people behind bars. Um, in the past couple of years, a few years, uh, we've worked a lot on many cases where young people like junior high school students or senior high school students got arrested only for one very small joint of cannabis and then ended up in prison for two years, three years, five years. And you know, it's it's horrible situation if they are in prison. Um, it's overcrowded, they have HIV problem inside the prison, they have TB problems. Um, if they've never encountered any criminal offenses and then they got in prison and then they learn new techniques for criminal offenses and they drop out from schools and cut loose the educations and the work. And so this is the, the law that is intended to uh, save young people, but it precisely does the opposite. Conclude our discussion and following up uh, what uh, Damon uh, started with uh, s telling the governments what to do. So if, if you would be in a position to uh, to produce a, like a to-do list for governments who are sitting there in the Committee of the Whole and the, in the plenary meetings, what would be on the top of your list? Let's start with Julie. Oh, gosh, that is a painful, painfully or difficult question. I mean, I think, I don't know if I'm going to answer it very well, but I think one of the things that I, I would like for governments to understand or to consider the possibility of is the promise that an indivisible uh, collective understanding of human rights holds for helping to constructively and more... Uh, effectively design and implement drug policies. It's not just about stopping the killings. It's about figuring out ways to get to the root causes of why there is such grotesque inequalities, uh, why, um, why there's such an absence of services to support and embolden uh, young people um, to get a better education and to find better economic opportunities is absent. And these are all really important human rights questions, particularly around economic, social, and cultural rights. And so uh, to really embrace the indivisible uh, and uh, nature of human rights, reflecting that uh, human rights is, is part of our political, social, economic, and cultural lives. Um. I think the most priority would be to have an open and honest debate on drugs and drug policy because it's currently dominated by um, stigmatizing uh, discourse like drugs are seen as evil, stay away from people with drugs, uh, they are threats of the society, those kind of images. Um, they use this um, horrific languages to describe people who use drugs or people uh, committing for drug offenses without knowing the backgrounds or the roots of the problems. Uh, for example, many women um, who are involved in drug trafficking and they are uh, manipulated by their partners or uh, exploited by the traffickers. But when they got arrested, media portrayed them as queen of heroin instead of understanding why they were first involved in drug trafficking without knowing that the root of the problem. Um, they only label with queen of heroin um, it kind of closed down the, the real problem that we have. 
And so I think there's an urgent need to have this uh, public debate on on drugs and its and and the policies that that we are implementing it uh, in 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 local context as well. Um, yeah. So uh, one of the one of the big problems in, in drug control is that the vast majority of time, uh, effort, and resources goes into law enforcement. So uh, I would um, I would say decriminalize personal possession immediately, decriminalize subsistence farming immediately, uh, and substantially reinvest resources into uh, health, social care, and development, and away from law enforcement, which is not only ineffective, but delivers the vast majority of the human rights problems that we all face. Amen. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for joining me today. And thank you for those who, who watch the show. Uh, you can follow the news on uh, the CND on cndblog.org, uh, where you can find blogs about the CND. Thank you very much.